this video, I'm going to show you how to use a real quantum computer from home for free to generate quantum entanglement yourself. This is completely free and not sponsored in any way, although IBM, feel free to hit me up. Anyways, the way quantum computing works right now is through the cloud. Since it's impossible for everyone to have a quantum computer in their own house, the only way to access them is remotely. There are a few ways to do this, but in this video I'm going to focus on Qiskit for no reason other than that it's the most common method. First, you need to make an IBM Quantum account and get your API key. To do this, make an account on the IBM Quantum API site, and then navigate over to get your API key and copy it. Once you've done this, you can open a Python file or notebook. To make this as accessible as possible, I'm going to work in Google Colab, which is an online coding platform which lets you execute Python code in the browser. After opening this notebook, the first thing that you want to do is to create a variable that we'll call the API key. This will store the API key that we got from IBM. We can then just copy and paste that key in, and don't forget to make it a string by typing the double quotations. For those of you who don't know much coding, this just means that Python will read the API key as a text instead of something else. Anyways, once we've opened this notebook, we can go ahead and move forward. The next thing that we want to do is install the proper libraries necessary for the coding that we'll be doing. To do this, we'll run the following commands. pip is a Python package manager which basically makes it easy to install all of the necessary components of libraries without having to worry about downloading things manually. NumPy and Matplotlib are specific libraries that are often used for various components of data analysis and make our lives a lot easier. Next, we'll have to set up access to the quantum computer. Since we already have an API key, we should be able to access the hardware. There are two broad classes of hardware that we can use in Qiskit, those being simulators and actual quantum computers. Generally, it's a good idea to run whatever you want to run on a simulator before running it on a quantum computer to check that you haven't made any silly mistakes in making your quantum circuit. Since these quantum computers are open to the general public, there's usually a queue of people waiting to run their algorithms on the hardware. Also, a free license only gets you so much compute time. First, we'll set up the simulator using the Air Simulator class. This is basically a local simulation that will run on your hardware, whatever that is. For example, if that's your own computer, then it'll run on your system, and if you're using Google Colab, it'll run on whatever Google has given you. Either way, we'll be running this simulation on a classical computer. Once you've initialized the backend, you're good to go ahead and run a job. To show that, let's make a very simple quantum circuit. A quantum circuit is just a series of logic gates applied to qubits. In Qiskit, we can use these logic gates by calling our quantum circuit and then specifying the gate and qubit to which we want to apply that gate. The circuit that we'll make, for example, creates a bell state. We can go ahead and make a register of two qubits. This means that we'll have two qubits to operate on. Then we'll apply a Hadamard gate to the first one and a C naught between the first and the second. This generates a bell state, which is a maximally entangled state. To break this down a bit, we first start with two qubits both in the zero state. We then apply a Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate takes our first qubit in the zero state and puts it in an equal superposition of the zero and the one state. That means that there is an equal probability of measuring either one or zero. Importantly, this does not mean that our qubit is like a coin that we've flipped but not looked at yet. The qubit really is in a combination of both of these states at the same time. It hasn't just picked one, but we can't see it. The C0 gate then operates a not on the second qubit, but only conditionally based on the state of the first. For example, if the first qubit is in the zero state, no not gate is applied, making the state 0, 0. On the other hand, if the first qubit is in the one state, then the second qubit is also in the one state because the not gate is applied. Since the first qubit is in a superposition of 0 and 1 at the same time, the total state of the quantum computer becomes 0, 0 plus 1, 1 meaning an equal superposition of the two possibilities. There's also a coefficient out in the front that just makes the probabilities add to one, but we're not going to worry about that for now. It turns out that this specific superposition is entangled. I did an entirely separate video on quantum entanglement that I'll link below for you to watch after this one. But suffice it to say, for here, quantum entanglement is a special type of superposition that's created by taking two quantum systems and making them interact with one another. For superconducting qubits, like the ones that we're using from IBM, this is usually done by turning on electrical interactions between the qubits. Usually we do this by switching on a resonator that couples them. 
Anyways, if we set up the simulator backend and then run this circuit, we can plot the results. We should expect to see about 50% zeros and 50% ones, and in fact we do. Now we can go ahead and run this on the quantum computer. Let's go ahead and connect to a quantum backend. The best way to do this is to use the least busy function, which gets the quantum computer with the shortest queue. Once we've run this, we can check the backend that we were assigned simply by printing out its name. Now we can do the same kind of thing that we did before with the simulator. We'll run the job on the hardware, except now we have to do some extra steps to actually use the quantum computer. First, we'll make this thing called a pass manager. This helps us optimize our circuit for the specific hardware that we're using. This is some super low level stuff. Not meaning that it's easy, but low level meaning that it's close to the hardware. This kind of stuff is not usually stuff that you need to think about when programming a classical computer. When programming a quantum computer, however, different hardware may have different methods of implementing gates or a different base set of gates programmed into it. The pass manager handles this and allows us to transpile our circuit. We call this function for the specific hardware that we're on and it changes our circuit to fit the hardware. Hopefully in the future, as quantum hardware matures, we'll be able to move past these transpilers and other low-level functions, and they'll kind of just be disguised. Once we've set up this transpilation, we can run the job which sends the computation to the IBM Quantum API. It's important to note here that this step runs pretty quickly, but that does not mean that the circuit has run yet. This step just sends out the circuit to the queue, but it does not wait for it to execute. If you want to check on the status of your job, you can type job.status to see whether it's in the queue, running, or done. Once the job is done, we want to plot the results. To do this, we'll first get the results from the job. We can try and print these, but all we'll see if we do that is this weird results object, which doesn't help us. Instead, we'll need to use the counts like we did before. To do this, we'll type the following into Qiskit. Here, the zero is the index inside that result object that we saw before and the C corresponds to the name of the classical register, basically the classical bits that we stored the measurement outputs in. If we run this, we now have a dictionary that contains the counts of all the qubits. We can then call the plot histogram function, which outputs the measurements for all the qubit state combinations. Indeed, after doing this, we see the vast majority of the counts are the 0, 0, and 1, 1 states, which is what we expect for our bell state. Except here we also see some 0, 1 and 1, 0 as well, which should not show up if this was perfect. The reason for this is that each gate has some small error associated with it, and two qubit gates, especially those on these older IBM Eagle quantum processors, are relatively lower fidelity. This means that they have a significant chance of having errors. In other words, when we tried to create a perfect bell state, in reality what we created was a slightly imperfect bell state. That said, this is still a highly entangled quantum state between our two qubits on the quantum computer. If you found this video interesting, check out this other video I made on coding a real quantum algorithm. And if you want to learn more about entanglement, check out this video where I talk about quantum entanglement in greater detail. Until next time, I've been Lucas, this has been Lucas's Lab, and thanks for watching.